Um, I've asked to talk specifically on the issue of campaigning and its value and importance. And unfortunately, because of my campaign, this is going to be a real flying visit. I've only arrived 15 minutes ago, and when I finish speaking, I'm going to have to go as well. So I'm really, really, really sorry, but we're in the middle of a very big campaign, uh, which you may or may not have heard of, uh, concerning discrimination in the Olympics. Um, I'll digress from what I was planning to say, to say a bit more about that, perhaps, to begin with. Um, many of you are aware that the Olympics are bound by the Olympic Charter. And one of the fundamental principles of the Olympic Charter is that there should be no discrimination in sport, either in the Olympics or in the National Olympic Committees of the individual countries or the sporting events they organize. Yet, as we all know, there is massive, widespread discrimination in the Olympic movement, and there will be at the London 2012 Games. And I'll just talk about one example. There are several, but there's many different examples. But one example is, of course, discrimination against women. Uh, as you all know, it is the tradition of the IOC president, Jack Rogg, to present the gold medal to the winner of the men's marathon, but not to the winner of the women's marathon. And we think that's outrageous. We think that the IOC president should be giving the gold medal to both the winner of the men's marathon and the winner, winner of the women's marathon. Uh, there needs to be an equality in the actions of the IOC president. And up till now, that hasn't been the case. We're hoping that this year we will persuade him at last, and perhaps John can have a word in the uh, ear of the Prime Minister or others, to say to Jack Rod in the IOC that it's not right that only the gold medal is presented to the male marathon winner and not to the winner of the women's marathon. That does symbolically underscore the fact that women are not treated equally by the Olympic movement. But that, of course, is just one aspect of gender discrimination uh, in the Olympic movement. Uh, there are many, many others. For example, when you total up the number of events, uh, there are far more men's events than there are women's events. So male competitors have a much greater chance to win an Olympic gold medal or a silver or bronze than women competitors. And we see a whole range of events, particularly canoeing, boxing, rowing, and so on, where women have fewer events. And some of these fewer events are based on the sexist assumption that women are the weaker sex. So, for example, there is no women's 50-kilometer walk. There is no women's decathlon. And my view is, it's up to women to decide whether they have the strength and the will to compete in those events. And we know that there are female competitors who are quite capable of doing a decathlon or doing a 50-kilometer walk. To say that they can't even compete, that is a sexist discrimination. There are also many countries that will be attending the Olympics who impose very severe restrictions on women. For example, in Saudi Arabia, girls are forbidden to do physical education or sport in school. And the government of Saudi Arabia provides no facilities at all for women to play sport. There have been some attempts to set up private women's gyms and women's sports clubs but most of these have been closed down by the government of Saudi Arabia. Um, the Saudi government also has rules, for example, that uh, if women are playing sport, uh, they must be accompanied at all times by a male guardian. Um, they must not uh, dress immodestly. They must dress completely head to toe, regardless of whether they wish to do so. Similar restrictions apply in Iran. Iran has totally segregated sports for both spectators and participants. There is no mixing allowed of competitors or spectators in sports events in Iran. Um, Iranian women athletes, the Iran does let women play sports, but they have to be covered head to toe, even if they don't want to. And we know that many Iranian women athletes object to the way in which they are forced to cover head to toe. They don't want to, but they are forced to 
by the Iranian Olympic Committee, with the sanctioned support of Jacques Rogg and the International Olympic Committee. And of course, this requirement means there can be no Iranian women swimmers. You, know, you can't, using the attire that's required, swim in any competition, let alone an Olympic one, wearing that kind of clothing. Um, Iran also imposes restrictions saying that sportswomen cannot participate in any event where they may have physical contact with a male referee. Uh, Iranian women athletes are not allowed to have male coaches. Now again, this is a whole range of discriminations that only apply to women athletes in Iran, and this is sanctioned, these discriminations are sanctioned by the International Olympic Committee. Um, if you look at other areas, um, for example, in more than 150 countries, it would be impossible for a lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender athlete to be selected for their national Olympic squad because of the level of homophobia and, and transphobia in their societies. So in many, many countries, in most countries, LGBT athletes have to hide their sexuality in order to get selected. And of course, they live under the fear that if they were discovered, in more than 80 countries, they could face imprisonment, and in a few of those countries, they could even face execution. So quite clearly, when it comes to sport in the Olympics, there is not a level playing field. Likewise, in many countries, there is race and ethnic discrimination. In many countries, ethnic minorities uh, suffer discrimination, for example, in uh, the provision of sports facilities or access to competition, because they are culturally and economically deprived, because they don't have uh, the kinds of sports facilities that the majority of the population has, they can never develop their uh, talents. Uh, that means that, again, for the selection for the National Olympic Committee squads, many ethnic minority uh, peoples don't have a fair opportunity. Uh, in India, for example, uh, the Dalit population, so-called untouchables, their social and economic marginalization is so extreme that they could never ever, no matter what potential talent they may have, they could never ever almost uh, find the opportunity for selection for India's Olympic squad. And until recently, until recently, the man who was going to carry the Indian flag in the opening ceremony tonight was a man who stood accused of the massacres of Sikhs in Kashmir in 1984. It's only because of a global protest that India has finally uh, decided to uh, remove that one from him, but has not said whether he'll be coming, and the British government has not said whether he'll be allowed into the country. In my view, that man, Jagrit Heitler, should not be allowed into the country, given the very serious, grave uh, evidence that points to his implication in the massacre of Sikhs in 1984. Um, there are, of course, many other tyrants and tortures coming to these Olympics. You're going to have President Aliyev of Azerbaijan, whose regime is accused of torture, uh, arrest and detention of journalists and opposition politicians. You're going to have uh, Prince Nasser al-Khalifa, the head of Bahrain's <coughs> Olympic Committee, who in reports from human rights organizations was personally involved in the arrest and abuse of over 150 Bahraini athletes who took part in the pro-democracy protests last year. We've got evidence from those athletes and from Bahrain and European human rights groups which say that he personally was involved in torturing people, or abusing them at least, slapping them, kicking them, punching them, and so on. He of course denies the allegations, but the evidence is pretty, 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 pretty shocking and pretty uh, overwhelming. He will be an honored guest of the International Olympic Committee and the London Olympic organizers tonight at the Olympic Stadium. He shouldn't even be allowed in the country. He should not even be allowed to come into Britain, given these charges against him. 
I could go on through a whole list. Swaziland, Uzbekistan, Saudi Arabia, the list of tyrants and torturers coming to these games and being given honored VIP status is absolutely wrong. It's not only against our humanitarian values, it's against the international agreed humanitarian values and standards, and of course against the Olympic Charter's humanitarian values. The Olympic Charter isn't just about sport. It is about human rights, it's about ethics, it's about morality, it's about protecting human rights. And sadly, that aspect of the Olympic Charter is often ignored and neglected. So that sort of explains the current campaign, or at least a bit of it. Um, one thing we're doing is I've set up an online petition with Avaz. I think many of you know Avaz, the petition organization. A petition to appeal to Jacques Robb, the president of the International Olympic Committee, to present the gold medal to both the winner of the men's marathon and the winner of the women's marathon. It's a very easy, simple request, a very important, symbolic request. I know it's just a gesture, but gestures are sometimes important. Now, if we can persuade Jack Robb to give medals to both American winners, that will help at least symbolically underscore the principle that male and female athletes should be equal, and that men and women in our society and the world over should get equal treatment. So please go to the Avaz website, find that petition, and sign it, and get your friends to sign it. We've got about just under two weeks to persuade the International Olympic Committee to change its mind. Now, having said all that, um, back to the, the substance of what I was going to talk about, which was why campaigning is important and how to make it happen. Um, my own campaigns are inspired by people like Mahatma Gandhi, Sylvia Pankhurst, Martin Luther King, and to some extent, Malcolm X. What I've done over the last 45 years is mold my methods on their direct action tactics. And of course, invented a few of my own. But I've seen these people as iconic figures in human history who brought about huge fundamental changes for the benefit of humanity. So listen and learn. That was my first maxim when I decided to get involved in campaigning. To look at how others did it to look at their methods, their tactics, their successes, their failures, and to adapt and develop accordingly. One thing about all those people I mentioned is that they were at first champions of very small, marginal, minority causes. Causes that were often quite unpopular. But, undeterred, they took on the establishment and eventually helped secure huge advances in human freedom and social justice. And likewise, with my own campaigns, many of the campaigns I've done over the last four plus decades have been initially dismissed as marginal, often demonized, uh, including, for example, my advocacy in the 1960s of Aboriginal land rights in my homeland of Australia, uh, my opposition to Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War and the death penalty which existed in my hometown of Melbourne. Uh, my advocacy for the right of the Palestinian people to have a homeland. And of course, my early campaigning for women's and gay liberation. All these causes, when I began them in the 1960s, were deeply unpopular and marginal. Yet over time, gradually, slowly, surely, I, with many others, working together, managed to help change public opinion and consciousness. And I think that my experience of decades of activism has led me to conclude that sometimes you do get quick results. And let's hope we get a quick result with Jack Robb in the IOC in the next couple of weeks. But sometimes it takes longer. And I think if you're going to be doing campaigns, You've got to be prepared for a good deal of perseverance, determination, and patience. You need sometimes to be in it for the long haul. Do not expect instant overnight results. In 1969, when I first began campaigning for LGBT freedom, 
I calculated it would take about 50 years to win legal equality. Not to change hearts and minds and change everything, but just to win formal legal equality would probably take about 50 years. And I'm going to think to myself, I'm only 17 now, but you know, I hope that by the time I'm 57, 67, whatever, um, these changes will be brought about. And they have. For the most part, with the exception of the ban on same-sex civil marriage, and one or other small issues, we have won, within 50 years, LGBT equality. Um, now, I'm not saying that all of you have to have a 50-year timeline, uh, but sometimes to have that long-term vision is what you need to see you through the ups and downs of the campaign. Because you're always going to have setbacks. That's part of the course. Take them in your stride. Don't be deterred. Keep your eyes fixed on the long-term goal. Keep that vision in your mind. Keep that determination, that passion alive. I think if you want to have a campaign, the starting point is, of course, to have a vision about what you want to change. And then to understand why it needs to change. Who needs to be persuaded to change and how to make that change happen. In other words, set your goals and plan <coughs> to make it happen. A successful org organization with a successful campaign needs a plan. You need to have a plan and to set out where you're going and how you're going to get there. Um, in this allies, you know, try to isolate the opponents of change by building coalitions. You know, a broad base of support makes it much easier to affect change. I think in our own recent history of the, the campaigns for Scottish and Welsh devolution, you know, initially, those were small, fringe, marginal campaigns. But the people behind them built coalitions across political parties, across social movements, across communities, and gradually, the majority view was that Scottish and Welsh evolution was a good thing. Likewise with the campaign against apartheid, both in South Africa and around the world, it was all based upon alliances and coalitions, involving masses of people, students, trade unions, political parties, churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, bringing together a vast number of people, all agreed that apartheid must go. That's what gave the movement its impetus, its energy, and of course, ultimately, its success. Um, if you espouse change that seems, at the moment, unpopular, or is not on the political radar, be inventive and imaginative. Think about ways in which you can excite people, get people to notice what you're doing. Um, think about, and this is controversial, Think about adapting the tactics of guerrilla warfare, but apply them non-violently. Um, guerrilla methods have traditionally been the way in which the weak have been able to defeat the powerful. As for example, in the case of little tiny impoverished Vietnam vanquishing the mightiest military superpower in history, the United States. A classic example of how guerrilla tactics can work. Now what I'm saying is, apply those same principles non-violently to whatever your campaign is that you feel strongly about. Um, I can remember, for example, in London, never mind the rest of the country, in London until 1990, you could be arrested if you were a same-sex couple and you kissed or cuddled in the street. That was regarded as public indecency. And people were arrested. Same-sex couples were arrested for really kissing and covering in the street, as any heterosexual couple would quite normally and naturally do. We tried for years to negotiate with the Metropolitan Police to change that policy. <coughs> they wouldn't listen. They just carried on. They did talk to us. They gave us tea and sandwiches. They smiled. They shook our hands, but then went away and ordered more arrests. So we hit on the idea of a way of challenging them. So we announced 
when I say we, this is the LGBT direct action group outrage, we announced that we were going to hold a mass kiss-in in Piccadilly Circus, and we were challenging the police, if you think this law is worth enforcing, come and arrest us all. If you don't, make it clear that this law will no longer be enforced. And of course, we liaised with the media in the weeks beforehand. It got huge, huge media coverage. There were debates on every TV program and radio phoning program. A majority of people, to our surprise, agreed with us that this was an outrageous waste of police resources and public money. If no one was being harmed or hurt, no one was complaining, why should kissing or cuddling by same-sex couples be any more criminal than that of opposite-sex couples? So anyway, we, we announced our kissing, and we prepared for our kissing. I think about 300 couples turned up uh, to do this mass kissing, this mass challenge to the police, arrest us or scrap this law. One hour before the protest, I got a message from the then much forgotten police commissioner, Paul Gondon, saying that henceforth, from that day, no same-sex couple would be arrested in the London metropolitan area for merely kissing its husband. So we won. <laughs> we won even before we began. I think it's a really good example of how campaigns with imagination, a bit of daring, can actually, first of all, get media attention, which is the precondition for raising public awareness. If you can get your cause or issue on the 6 o'clock news or the 10 o'clock news, that helps raise awareness. It makes the public aware of an issue. It also puts those in power and authority on the spot, because journalists will then go to them and say, you know, this is what these people are complaining about. This is what they want. What are you going to do about it? So then the government, the police, the judges, whoever, they have to answer. So it's a very, very effective way of using moral leverage and publicity leverage to help uh, ensure that injustice is challenged and that change comes about. Um, I'll just finish by saying that, of course, I've mainly done direct action, but sometimes I work within the system. Sometimes I'm very happy to go and have tea with the Archbishop of Canterbury, invites me, which is very rarely. Um, other times I'm, I'm quite happy to sit down with the police and to talk through issues and problems. But I say that when those methods don't work, then the choice is either give up or you have to up the ante. You know, if you just get fobbed off and allow yourself to be fobbed off, the people in power have won. Don't let that happen. Work within the system where you can, but when it doesn't work, when you don't get a result, don't be afraid to step outside the system and use the tactics of Mahatma Gandhi, the suffragettes, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X. Use those methods to push the case for universal justice and human rights. Thank you.